Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the first full day of the Learning Revolution Conference Online. Uh, Pat Ferenga is our opening keynote speaker today. Pat, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure to be here. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you. We've had keynotes the last three nights, uh, pre-conference keynote sessions that have been really terrific. Today we have a full set of keynotes and regular sessions. And Pat is sort of the perfect speaker to kick us off. Thanks to ClassFlow for their support of this event and next week's Reinventing the Classroom activity. And thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for the terrific platform which allows us to do all of this online conferencing. For those of you who are live in the room, and we're small but mighty, we're a small group this morning. Look to the left of the map, click on the star, or have to click on it twice, and then you can click on the map and let us know where you're participating from. You know, we've got um, John from Atlanta. Maureen, you're northeast, right? I don't know where you're from, but feel free to guess Maureen in Massachusetts. Close the pad. Oh, yeah. And Jose, let us know where you're coming in from. Jose, if you've just made us international, we'll all be delighted. Mm -hmm. Looks like Spain. Have fun. Okay, Pat, again, I, uh, I'm personally really excited to have you kicking us off today. I know it's early. You have a cup of coffee. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the time over to you. Feel free to do any kind of self-introductions that you would like, and then um, we'll stick here and, and help out. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I hadn't planned on doing uh, an introduction, so I'll just improvise a quick one. Um, I've worked with uh, John Holt, um, who's the founder of Growing Without Schooling magazine, and he's also one of the proponents of uh, self-directed learning for children in school. And when that wasn't working in school, he decided, well, maybe we could help him learn this way outside of school. And he became one of the founders of the homeschooling movement. Um, my wife and I um, have gone back and forth with uh, this whole issue of self-directed learning, as I think every unschooling parent does, um, everyone gets cold feet depending on you know, where they're at in this process at, at different stages. But we have found that it has been a very effective way for our daughters to learn. They're all grown up. They've gotten into college and they're in, in work. One's in graduate school. So self-directed learning has certainly worked for me and for my family and for many thousands of others. Um, but it is different, and this is why I think so many people get um, uh, flustered o over this concept, um, because we've all been in school, and school teaches us the need to be taught. It just, it just gets ingrained in us, right? I mean, hour after hour, there we are, you know, in school, being taught, <laughs> you know. Um, and then all of a sudden we have this strange idea that, you know, no, treat children like you, you would as if they were just born or as if schools didn't exist, and, uh, and they will learn as well. And, of course, a lot of people doubt that. So what I'd like to do is uh, look at self-directed learning not just as teacherless learning by children. Uh, this is often how it's presented. But the role of the teacher still exists, but it's different when the child decides when, where, how, and from whom to learn. And therefore, the context and purposes of teaching are radically different in this configuration. This talk is going to outline how a different kind of teacher is emerging from the ferment of unschooling, democratic schools, technology, and social perceptions about children in society today. Now, people often cite the work of John Holt and Ivan Illich as foundational texts for understanding how children learn and grow without going to school. But most readers focus on Holt and Illich's descriptions 
of people's self-directed learning and how conventional school so often thwarts it. However, Fulton Illich wrote extensively about teaching in the 70s and 80s, and more recent teachers, such as Sugata Mitra and Chris Macaliano, are adding to this discussion. Now, I could speak about this topic for, for weeks, it turns out. As, as, as the more I thought about it, I, I realized, you know, I mean, I've had this discussion before, but it doesn't come up a lot in homeschooling circles and unschooling circles in particular, because so often it seems like we're spending time trashing uh, teachers in schools. But, you know, Holt wrote an entire, entire books about, you know, the problems of teaching, but also how to overcome them, what else teachers can do instead of their authoritarian methods, and how to become authoritative teachers instead. For instance, his books, What Do I Do Monday, and The Underachieving School. I mean, and, and for Ivan Illich, you could spend a year just talking about his ideas about teaching. They, they go all, <laughs> they cover the whole gamut of, of history, for crying out loud. So to make this task manageable, I want to take what I consider six key ideas about teaching self-directed learners from these writers. And uh, Put them forth and, and see if we could perhaps come up with some sort of framework that um, you know we could we can s sort of start to discuss what the role of the teacher is. Now, another book that Holt wrote that discusses teaching in detail is his book about learning to play the, uh, music. It's called Never Too Late, and he wrote it in 1978, a year after he um, had founded Growing Without Schooling magazine. So in this book, John has an entire chapter about teachers and teaching. And he starts it this way, and I think this is, you know, this is the first point we need to accept if we're going to work with self-directed learners. Holt writes, the trouble with most teachers of music or anything else is that they have in the back of their minds an idea more or less like this. Learning is and can only be the result of teaching. Anything important my students learn, they learn because I teach it to them. Teachers make this belief clear by the way they teach, or talk about their teaching, or react, usually with anger, to the suggestion that their students might find out for themselves and be better for finding out much of what they are being taught. It is not enough for them to be helpful and useful to their students. They need to feel that their students could not get along without them. All my own work as a teacher and learner has led me to believe quite the opposite. That teaching is a very strong medicine, which like all strong medicines can quickly and easily turn into a poison. At the right time, that is, when the student has asked for it, and in very small doses, it can indeed help learning. But at the wrong times, or in too large doses, it will slow down learning or prevent it altogether. The right kind of teacher can be a great help to a learner, particularly of music. The wrong kind can be worse than none. In the four years or so since I began to play seriously again, John's referring to picking up the cello. I have been on the lookout for the right kind of teacher, one whom I liked both musically and personally, and thought might be ideal was, as far, was and is far too busy to take on someone as unskilled as I am. Another, strongly recommended to me by a cellist friend whom I trust, is out of town most of the time and in any case is tired of teaching and wants to stop. Meanwhile, I continue to learn a great deal on my own. What kind of teacher I want and why I want that kind and not some other is what this chapter is about. When I began to play the cello and took lessons from Hal Spruill, he was the perfect teacher for me. I loved working with him. You can hardly imagine how I could have gotten started without him or someone like him. When, at age 50, I began to play again, I took three lessons from a cellist friend, then stopped. Though I have since played a great deal of chamber music under professional coaching, I have had no further individual lessons. This seems to shock many people. When they ask, who are you studying with? And I say, no one right now. They are surprised. 
Some even become indignant or angry. Why am I not taking lessons, they demand to know. How do I expect to learn anything unless I do? The answer is that some of what students get from their teachers, I no longer need or can get in other ways. Some I am not yet ready for, and some I don't want at all. So I'd like to just break, you know, examine that passage a little bit, because there's a lot of deep thought in there, I feel. And, and um, first of all, the role of the teacher, you know, as, as John indicates here, is an important one. And it shouldn't be taken lightly. But that role is supposed to support the learner's goals. Clearly, this is not how teaching is conceived of in school, where the teacher must support the Board of Education's goals and drive each child across that goal line. The difference can be summed up as a difference between working with children versus working on children. Another interesting point that is, is in this passage, but it's not explicit, is what it's like to be a learner. John was very quick to tell people that if you want to know what it's like to be a child, try to learn something new, like a foreign language or an instrument. For John, that was instruments, although he was always interested in languages, and towards the end of his life, he really wanted to learn Japanese. Um, it's another story, but it's never too late to learn. That's <laughs> John, John's example always proves to me. So the learner is able to not only indicate when they want to learn something, but also when they want to stop learning it. And this really seems to drive people crazy. But as adults, we do this all the time. As John says, maybe I can get what the teacher is giving me in other ways, or I no longer need it. I get it. I want to move on. I mean, there's a lot of dynamics built into the teacher thing, um, the teacher-pupil relationship, besides instruction. I mean, you know, some teachers, you know, need the steady income, so they're happy to have a student, even if they're not playing the piano during piano lessons, just sit there and talk for an hour. I mean, such things happen. But, you know, um, so teaching is, is, is a lot broader than, than just, you know, giving, giving instruction, but it's also tied into so many other things that we have a hard time seeing that. Am I helping this child or am I, <laughs> or is, is, is this something that, that I'm really helping myself more with. And so teaching become, you know, becomes pretty tricky once you decide that you need to force them to learn, even from the best of intentions, because you know, I mean, the famous phrase, it's for their own good. I am doing this for their own good. I know they won't like it. But, you know, if we don't let children in particular, learners, refuse treatment, if they don't learn how to make choices and say no, or this is working for me, this isn't, what are we doing to children? You know, what are we teaching them? That's part of the problem with the hidden curriculum. You know, we're teaching them to, to obey authority blindly. There's a, there's, a lot, there's a lot to this concept of teaching and learning, and it's not just as simple as let learners do whatever they want or just let teachers be authoritarian. Um, Holt was adamant that teaching is not a mystery, although to listen to most people talk about it, you would think that education is one of the most complicated and difficult tasks ever, ever created by humans. But again, when I was in school and college in the uh, 70s, I used to have undergraduate degrees in, in education. I did away with those in the 80s um, because people like John Holt and many others were saying, you know, they're, they're learning how to get degrees in education, but they're not learning how to teach. <laughs> and so that criticism uh, was finally felt. I mean, these things seem to take decades. But um, then schools have changed, so now there's no longer an undergraduate degree in education. You, know, you, you typically have to get a four-year degree in a subject such as math or science or English, and then an additional year, and then you get a, a degree in education. And I was, you know, th there was no PhD for education; it used to be called the EdD. And now, just in recent years, I believe Harvard and some other schools are now giving PhDs in education. So this whole idea that teaching is like a firm science that that it that it that it's 
like like mathematics that that that, that one plus one always equals two. Well, it's not. <laughs> you know, I mean, teaching itself is if you just look look at how it's being organized and how they're they're constantly reshuffling what teachers need to know and what what they have to teach the kids. It's you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of politics that get involved in this. You know, as I was talking about the teacher learning relationship, but if we could just put that aside and get down to the the brass tacks of of what teaching is, I think Holt has summed it up very well in in this passage. Um, we can break these down and, and, and run entire courses on them, but these are important things that, that a lot of teachers know. But some of the, I just want to highlight one or two big differences. And certainly one of them is give people as much time as they want and need to absorb what you have shown or told them. I have had this experience, and perhaps some of you have, um, where things that you thought your chi your child or a friend that you were working with didn't get or didn't understand, weeks or months later come up in a conversation that somehow they were working with that in their subconscious, or they were just too embarrassed to speak openly about it as they were chewing the ideas over. But in school, every minute of every day is in detail. Not, not in all schools. I mean, you know, we know that, like, not the Albany Free School or Sudbury School. But most public schools, my wife works in a, in a charter school, and every minute, from the minute you walk in the classroom, is, is accounted, you know, from do nows all the way down to, you know, how you're going to line up and get out of the classroom at the end. How do you give people the time they need, you know, uh, to absorb these things? And when it's like, run school, run. I mean, it really is sort of a factory model that we've created. So this is one of the big issues that, that um, self-directed learning faces in school, is that we don't give them enough time, you know, because we expect everyone who's the same age to learn at the same rate. And that's ridiculous, but we do. And, you know, this is one of those key principles that, um, while it makes perfect sense, and we all know this as adults, I mean, some people pick up stuff at work immediately, others <laughs> never get it or take a long time to get it. You know, we're patient with adults, or we try to be, but, you know, when it comes to kids, we don't seem to have that uh, patience. And then, you know, the other thing is scaring people only blocks learning. That is a foundational principle that Holt discovered when he was teaching fifth grade in his first book, How Children Fail. But look, I mean, school, is, if anything, we turned education into, into this scary process for children. You know, uh, and when I revised Teach Your Own, I, I wrote about a UN study that found that five-year-old children in Britain were worried about their futures based on their test scores in school. Um, it, it, and, and we see this, I mean, even before we got into the standardized testing mania in America, you know, people were still worried that, you know, oh, I'm a bad student, so I'm not, I'm not going to get a good job. I mean, we, it's, these become self-fulfilling prophecies for 8-year-olds, even 16-year-olds or 25-year-olds. You know, so we really need to uh, to think that if we're going to work with self-directed learners, we need to, 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 to pull away from, like, the, the basic concepts of making children learn on a timed schedule and also threatening them with, you know, failure as an adult or failure right now as a child. Um, and, you know, those are just not good, good ways to help people learn. And, you know, and, and we know this. But for some reason, we've complicated it way, way too much. So the second point that I, I want to make that, that Holt brings out is the school teacher's lament. I teach, but they don't learn. Holt wrote about that in his first book, uh, How Children Fail, and he tried to figure it out. And in that book, of course, he found out that scaring the children, fear of failure, fear of being humiliated in front of the class, in front of their parents, and so on, that's what was preventing learning. But then John explored the, this even deeper. And when he revised How Children Fail and How Children Learn, after his uh, experiences working with homeschooling, he was always pointing this out. And that is, learning is the result of the activity of learners, not teachers. When 
a student decides they want to learn from a particular teacher, they willingly place themselves into the subservient role of pupil, and that makes the teacher-pupil relationship smoother. And we hear this all the time as unschoolers. Oh, your kids will never choose anything challenging. Your kids will never do anything. They'll always take the easy way out because they're given choices. But that hasn't been the case. I've seen so many children choose to study violin or voice or piano or GWS, Growing Without Schooling Magazine, and is full of stories. Um, you know, particularly in the 80s, we wrote a lot about Vita and Ishmael Wallace. You know, they, they apprenticed themselves and studied with some very difficult teachers, and they loved it. And, you know, um, I, I think of uh, another, another homeschooler I know, um, Eric, who uh, loves music and his, his family's musicians, everyone was like, oh, he's so easy going. But he had a deep interest in science. And he became an apprentice at the uh, Museum of Science here in Boston. And he, he, he fell in love with taking care of their live animals, the muscolids in particular. And became quite a little expert, uh, quite a big expert in, in, in those areas. And again, he just applied himself and worked with these people from his own volition. And you know, he said, yes, I will be there at 5 in the morning to take care of these animals. Um, and in my, our own case, our daughter Audrey, who is a, a very active uh, young lady and very opinionated, very strong-willed, um, when she was five, she wanted to learn karate. And she just really got into it. And, and, and my wife and I are still amazed at how, you know, because she wanted to study this, she submitted herself to the teachings of her sensei and she did all the exercises and kata religiously, and she loved it. But this is a kid who, like, every, you know, she had her own opinion about everything. But when they're ready, and we have to accept this about kids, they will do this. You know, this is the trust part of, of this, because it doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> you know, but these are, you know, these are things that, that um, happen over time. There's that time element again. Um, all right, so I'd like to, to take a quick pause here and, and see. I mean, there's so few of us here. I mean, is, you know, are, you, are you with me on this? Is there any comments or, or questions uh, about what I've said so far? Well, feel free to, to, to jump right in at, at, at any point. We're a, sm a very small group, so, so uh, I'd like to uh, try and get some conversation going if, if we can. Um, Pat, can you see Maureen's comment there in the chat? Oh, no, I didn't. Let me see. Are all students self-directed? Yes. They, I think everyone is. They all start off self-directed. How else? You know, I mean, it's, it, we're hardwired to learn. Um, what happens is, you know, incidents in, in our lives, at home and in school, turn that off. And, and, and we just have this idea that, um, uh, that, you know, you only learn something unless it's taught. You know, you have to, to take a, you know, read a book and take a test in order to prove that you know something. And then all of a sudden you get out of school and you're an adult and, you know, either that, that curiosity has been beat out of you and all you want to do is live for the weekend and sit on your couch, or you rediscover what it's like to learn. And, you know, I've had many um, adults talk about how through their homeschooling their children, they've discovered their own hobbies and their own love of self-direction. So um, I do think that it's hard to see self-direction, particularly, say, you know, in, in a school setting where we're encouraging children to follow the herd and do, and do what the teacher says and everyone, you know, be on the same page. So, you know, there is... There is a difficulty with implementing self-directed learning in the school, but I don't think that means that children are not, that we're not all born self-directed. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, and any others? I'm happy to talk more about that if you want. Pat, it seems like um, most of the people I know who are, work as formal educators would probably, if asked to give a detailed response would say that they see education as a combination both of control and supporting self-direction. Do you feel like it's just a question of where that balance is, or 
is the idea that we would use education to control something that you and or John Holt would ultimately have rejected? Well, it, that's a good question. It leads directly into the next slide and the next point I want to make about what is the teacher's responsibility. Um, you know, I think that, um, that where, and again, this devil's in the details, you know, but I will say that I think teachers over control, and, and they do that because of the pressure that they get from school. And that, you know, to, and it's just gotten crazy now where we have, you know, people who monitor the monitors who are monitoring the proctors of the tests. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just this huge panopticon of school now. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it must be hard. Uh, for for teachers, um, you know, especially you know when when they hear ideas like 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 how do you be responsive to students, um, because we're really you know we've really created a bind for them where we create a school where we actually control and predict what every child at every age is going to do, and then based on how they match up to that control and predictions, give them uh, behavior modifications and so on. I don't think we need that much. I mean, what we, you know, we do certainly need to know uh, if you're in a, in, in a situation in a school, you need to know what they know and how can I help them learn. I mean, if you need the SAT and 25 other standardized tests and all sorts of outside experts to tell you where this child is at in their ability to read or do math or play the piano or do a science experiment, I'm not sure you're a really good teacher. <laughs> And if you're in those subjects, you should be able to know after you know, a conversation and, and working with someone where they're at and, and go. So yeah, there is some level of control. And um, you know, I, but I would say there's way, way too much. And, that, and that's what I want to get into now with, with this teacher's responsibility um, piece. Because um, Ivan Illich uh, really got John Holtz uh, juices flowing in the in the 70s, and John got got Yvonne's flowing too about the, the concept of informal learning. But it was in Growing Without Schooling magazine uh, when Aaron Falbell interviewed Yvonne Illich that he made this, and again, this just arose in, in the course of a conversation. Uh, this wasn't some pre-planned uh, thing or Yvonne quoting from a book, but th the question came up, what about the teacher's responsibility? Again, you know, the teacher's responsibility is their job is to make children learn. I mean, that's what most people would think. But that word is, is, is so tricky, responsibility. You know, I mean, so if my job is to make these kids learn, I, you know, they start to fear lawsuits and they focus on all their, their responsibilities or to the school and the state, despite their knowledge that they're not serving children well in doing so. I mean, that's why I like to have things like the Badass Teachers Association and some of these, and, and the parents opting out of standardized tests. There is uh, a point now where people are saying this responsibility to the state and the curriculum is, is, is gone overboard. Um, and then Yvonne really looked at that word responsibility. And I never realized until I read this uh, response of his that it is related to the word response. Uh, um, you know, I'm not going to read, uh, or, or I'm leaving this up there for folks to read, but that last sentence um, I think is really key. It is in the interest of the school system to use the term responsibility in order to foster confusion between two entirely different directions in which a response can be given, affectionately to a person and defensively to the judge. So. All too often we say, um, you know, uh, uh, in the classroom that, that we don't have time for that now, we have to move on, you know. So you're, you're trying to be responsive to the child, but then you're dismissing them and saying, but we have to move on, you know. And so we get stuck in this responsibility trap of, of this. Now what's interesting about this is that um, John Holt maintained as a teacher that he could not help a child if he did not hold himself personally responsible for that child's learning. 
He didn't want to construct alibis and shift the responsibility to school personnel, the policies, the curriculum, poor parenting, and so on. So how can Holt say this and at the same time be an advocate for child self-directed learning? Let me illustrate this with a story Holt tells about how he struggled with Illich's ideas about teaching at first. In my earliest conversations with Illich, I was surprised at how skeptical and resistant he was to the idea of informal teaching. He defended very vigorously the idea of the old-fashioned schoolmaster. Later, I was surprised by the passion or even virulence of his argument or attack against the preschools. I thought I understood a great deal of what he was saying, but not the emotional weight with which he said it. On another occasion, he told me a story that completely baffled me. In the discussion after one of his talks in the U.S., a questioner was criticizing him sharply for not having made clear enough something he was trying to say. Illich interrupted and said, please sit down. I am not your teacher. He told me this story as if it were important so that I would understand it, but it was not for a year or more that I began to feel I did. Illich was saying, in effect, I have not agreed to be your teacher. Therefore, I am not responsible for your understanding or not understanding anything. If you want me to be your teacher, you must ask me. Even then, I will only agree if I feel reasonably certain that I can, in fact, teach you whatever it is you want to learn. If I think I can, I will set forth the conditions, the mutual responsibilities and obligations under which I will teach, and if you want to accept them, you may. Otherwise, I accept no responsibility for making you understand or blame if you do not understand. That is one of the hazards of discourse. It's important here to understand that Illich is most emphatically not saying that everything can be taught. Illich would undertake to, to teach Spanish. I am almost certain he would not undertake to teach philosophy, saying quite rightly that no man can make another man a philosopher. One of Illich's criticisms of schools and school people is that they do not even know the distinction between what they can teach and what they cannot. What cannot be taught, what is not learned by being taught. That last phrase really got me because in business and as a freelance uh, writer and editor, I'm always you know, worried about lost opportunity costs. If I take this job and I don't get it, will I have lost this other job that I should have been bidding on? If I study this, then I won't be able to study that. And in school, you know, we never talk about the lost opportunity costs. I mean, I remember, you know, I mean, I can easily imagine many children sitting in school wanting to either play an instrument or play a sport, play a board game, or read a book, and instead those opportunities are lost as they're sitting there going through yet you know, another example of how to you know, multiply mixed fractions. You know, um, certainly some students want that. You know, I see there's a, a question here, there's, uh, two good questions. Jose uh, asks how a teacher could learn to be self-directed. Um, I would say right off the top of my head two ways. One, learn something new so that they experience what it's like to be a learner. I mean, something like a, a language they've never spoken or a new instrument, as I've said, or it could be rock climbing, anything that, that just puts you out there, and then you get an idea of what it's like to be a self-directed learner. And then secondly, um, teachers could talk amongst themselves. I mean, teachers like Chris McCalliano, who we're going to talk about later, um, you know, they are willing to share this information. They could talk to them. There's a big gap between what's going on in the alternative school community and the public school community. And you know, trying to, to bridge that gap is, is, is another area that I think we need, need to, to address so that teachers can see that not only are there different ways of teaching but, and learning, but there are different types of personalities that get involved in teaching too, and that, and that you know, kids need a variety of these people. Um, how has the increased access to digital content accelerated John Holt's ideas is a, a question from John. Um, well, I can't say that there's a cause and effect there. I've never seen any study <laughs> to that effect and so on. However, there's no doubt that you know, having children get access or any learner to um, information that they want you know, with as few middlemen as possible really accelerates you know, these ideas. I mean, Elitch talked about learning webs in de-schooling society, 
and the internet is still not quite there, but we're, we're getting there. We're, we're getting there. So I do think that, that technology, and, and, and this is one of the things that um, really, again, supports self-directed learning. Tablets, mobile computing, smartphones. I mean, there are all sorts of ways that, that, that we'd be able to leverage this. It's like, you know, you're walking around with the, the Library of Congress in your pocket if you want. You know, why can't we leverage that, that, you know, so we get kids out of the classroom, maybe working with small pods of, of you know, five students who meet with a, a teacher in a certain location. They spread out over the, the city during the day. The teacher keeps track of them and meets up. I mean, there's so many other ways of, 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 of doing this, but we're, we're locked into this, this idea that school is everything. And, you know, what John Gatto noted, um, how many hours children spend in school, and then of course school is saying they need to do three hours of homework, and then you know the the time of um, that students spend commuting to and from school, and you know people were shocked when when, when he printed that and said, look at all the time that kids spend in school; they don't have any time for themselves. And then immediately, I, I forget who it was, but some conservative. Um, Educator immediately countered that by pointing that John Gatto didn't count the time that children were sleeping, and that if you count their sleep time, then they're not spending nearly as much time in school as he says. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, when, when that logic really kind of curls my hair. And, and this is one of the things that you really get from Yvonne and Holt when, when they talk about teaching, that the teacher-student relationship is important, and it is special, and it does work, but it should not be more than a small part of life. Learning is not just teachers and students. We also learn from conversation. We learn from being in groups. We learn from going to public events. We learn from being in crowds at, at, at political meetings. We learn from personal, by being quiet, by writing in our journals. We have relationships to nature and to physical objects that, that help us uh, explore our inner thoughts and also help create relationships to other ideas and, and people and subjects. You know, it's not just a teacher that, that creates learning. It's about the learner being the center of activity for learning and, and creating relationships, extending out into the world. Um, the student owes the school and the teacher everything and can be penalized if he does not deliver. The school and the teacher owe the student nothing. As someone once put it, there are very severe penalties for being a bad student, but there are no penalties at all for being a bad teacher. Holt writes, the students are quite right to reject this notion, but in this place they put an opposite and equally mistaken one, that in the proper student-teacher relationship, the teacher has infinite obligations to the student, and the students in return no obligations at all. This is the philosophy behind at least a certain number of free schools, free universities, and so on. The teacher is expected to be infinitely available and to respond with utmost sympathy and understanding to all the needs and demands of the student, but he cannot make any demands on the student. The student need not come to class, but he, should he feel like coming, the teacher must be there. The student need not read a book, but should he feel like discussing one, the teacher should have read it. The student has a right to withdraw from or reject any discussion that does not interest him. The teacher has no such right. Well, where Holt goes with that, and then Illich, is uh, that learning and teaching requires a mutuality in the teacher-pupil relationship. And it shouldn't be this overwhelming time sink of a relationship that it is today. We need to put strict parameters around the teacher-pupil relationship that are clear. Um, Holt says, the point is the teacher-student relationship is a special one and should not occupy more than a small part of life. In a conversation with Illich, he said to me quite emphatically, he did not want to spend all his life in a schoolhouse. To put this differently, he wants a very clear and sharp line to be drawn between those situations in which he is relating to another person as student to teacher, or vice versa, and those in which he is relating to another person as a human being and so as an equal. If he is going to enter into an inferior, superior relationship with another person in which one is clearly dependent on the other, he wants it clearly understood when for how long and for what purposes this relationship will go on. This is part of what Illich means about the convivial society. 
If he talks to other people, he wants to talk as equals, except in the spe special situations in which they have agreed that they will not talk as equals. So um, I'm going to leave Village now. Um, you know, but I, I just like to uh, uh, summarize the uh, four points so far. So for Holt, we've got teaching is strong medicine. You need to be careful how, when, and where you administer it. And learning is the result of the activity of learners, not teachers. From Illich, I'm taking the teacher-student relationship is a special one and should not occupy more than a small part of life. And the second point, there are mutual responsibilities in the teacher-student relationship. Now I'd like to go into some uh, more recent research and studies in this. And that is the work of Sugata Mitra. I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time detailing it. Uh, his work is very well known, um, particularly the hole in the wall experiment. Uh, it's a TED talk um, that was so popular, um, he eventually won a, a million dollar prize to create self-organized learning environments. So um, who is, you know, what, what is this guy and, and, and what is this experiment? Well, very briefly, Mitra is not a teacher. Like John Holt, he did not study to be an educator. He just sort of fell into it out of curiosity and interest. Um, Mitra was an engineer, and he was working in a uh, rural Indian village, and he decided to put a computer in a wall in the village and see what the children did with it. And he put a video camera outside to videotape what the kids did so we could see what was going on. Well, this experiment you know, was repeated many times in many different villages, and he amplified it and, and, you know, tweaked it in many different ways. But what he found is that Indian children um, living in rural areas could not only teach themselves and each other how to use the computer and the internet, but also how to read English and, and so that they can navigate the internet better and discover all sorts of information. Yeah, they played games, but they didn't just play games. They use it for serious stuff. And Mitra, at one point, sets the bar very high because so many people were skeptical that children were able to teach themselves. So he asked, I, I believe it was, can they talk about, would the children be able to describe DNA replication to him in English properly? Um, I'm paraphrasing this here. Um, and lo and behold, they did. <laughs> you know, Mitra, much to Mitra's surprise. Um, so one of the things that Mitra concludes from this is, is that, you know, by not having a teacher all the time, these kids were naturally relied on one another. They sort of crowdsourced their information. They used the Internet. They poked around, you know, getting all different bits, and they put it all together. Um, Mitra's work really emphasizes the group aspect of children working together, um, and as do like the Sudbury Valley Schools, and uh, Dr. Peter Gray in his book Free to Play also notes this. He has a chapter about Sugata Mitra's work in that book, by the way. So the, the, the two principles that I, I, I wanted to present that Mitra puts out there, and he has significant, you know, uh, experimental background to support these ideas, is that um, uh, the absence of a teacher might actually be a deliberate move. I mean, in, in his case, it, it, it just, it, it, you know, he just watched what happens. But he's saying that if you want people to be self-directed, one of the things you have to do is stop being the director. <laughs> and, uh, and so I love that, that, that uh, phrase of his, the absence of a teacher is a pedagogical technique. And after the hole-in-the-wall experiment, he did another experiment that's not as widely known, but I think it's, it's very interesting. And that's called the granny cloud. Um, very briefly, what that was was he wanted, when Mitra was asking these uh, children in rural India what they would like to, to learn and do in their classroom, they said that they would like to have a British grandmother read to them. And so, uh, well, they say British grandmother, but he, he, um, I forget how it came out, but basically, um, that's what Mitra is, was able to, to find was uh, these, these uh, he enlisted some retired school teachers, uh, gr many of them were grandmothers, and um, they would sit at a computer in, in, in Great Britain and through a, a link up talk to the kids in rural India, usually reading them stories and then talking to them about what they're doing 
in their in you know with their uh, work in in their lives and in you know what's going on in school. And what Mitro found was their their you know their test scores, which was what I guess he was using as a baseline, they improved, but the overall um, environment in the classroom improved. And he noted that rather than giving direct instruction, what the grandmothers were doing that was so effective was just telling the children, that's good, you can do it. I like how you did this. Oh, perhaps you should try some other colors when you, when you make that, that next time. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting to see uh, if you could do that? I mean, it's all encouragement. It's not like this is wrong, this is right. It's not this hypercriticality that, that, that we substitute as, as, as a sign for being smart. Um, you know, it's it, it's like it's teaching, it, it's giving children the confidence in themselves that they can figure these things out. Um, you know, I see it as a question here from Maureen. I wonder what Alfie Cohn thinks regarding the sometimes blind encouragement of the grannies. Um, I don't know. Um, I, 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 Alfie has got a new book out about you know spoiling about how we you know the nature of spoiling children and the whole controversy around that. I actually look forward to reading that. But um, I don't know. I mean, I get knowing Alfie a little bit. I imagine he would look closely at all of Mitra's research and then and then uh, <laughs> come up with some some angle on it. Um, but. I find that these two ideas really do jive very well with what we've experienced uh, in, or, or, in, as unschoolers over the past 30 years. But so often, I, I rarely have spent, I mean, I don't know karate. I don't want to know Japanese, you know? I, I don't have a deep interest in biology. My daughters all did. I don't, I, I don't dance. I love music, but I'm not a dancer. All three of my daughters are dancers. Encouragement has been the key. Having an interest in what they're, a genuine interest. And they know when I'm not interested. It's okay. Like, like, like John and Yvonne were saying, you, the teacher, should be respected too. You don't need to be the doormat. That, you know, I mean, it's a mutual relationship. What works for the students works for you too. So, um, it, it's a very, it's a very different, um, sort of environment that, that we're creating here. Um, and again, I, I like that Mitra and, and other teachers have been able to create this environment in the school, but I think it's also important to realize that they keep moving out of school with this and that technology and uh, the directions that, that we're seeing um, the technology take us is, is that we don't necessarily all need to be in the same room at the same time learning from the same teacher. So. What are the characteristics of a good teacher? Uh, we're fortunate that uh, Chris Macaliano, who was one of the founders of the Albany Free School, and all, all of whose books I recommend to you, um, really came up with this very interesting list just a couple of weeks ago um, on his blog. And what struck me about these characteristics of, of a, uh, a good teacher are how many of his points echo John's points. And I hope you'll go look at them. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, spend all 20. I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, but the common sense, practical philosophy that drives Chris's ideas behind what these characteristics of good teachers are jives so well. I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, Holt, Mitra, Macoliano, Illich, they all have a practical philosophy. In fact, you know, many unschooling and homeschooling writers have this. I mean, it's not, you know, for them, education is about living life and, and, and trying to have a good life. And it, it's related to your spirits and your spirituality or, or your lack thereof. But, I mean, it's, it's your connection to the world and how that is. I mean, you know, you want to work with that. Most teachers don't. They're scared. They have that legal responsibility. They can't be, you know, they're told never be friends with, with a student. You know, you're, you're, you've got to remain professional. And again, as Illich and Holt talk about that special relationship, yes. But the problem is, as you know, Holt mentioned uh, when he talked about free schools, when you blur that line, where they don't know, are you the friend or are you the teacher? Are we in the special relationship or are we equals? That, that can be very confusing and annoying <laughs> for both teachers and students. But, uh, you know, Chris, Chris really, really gets this. 
But what, what I, I wanted to end with is that all these ideas that I, I've been describing are how these writers have looked at what's happening outside of school, in, in homeschools, unschools, natural learning in history, as Illich looked at it, as well as you know, Chris McCallion and um, Mitra looking at it from the point of view of schools, you know, self -direct, it being self-directed learning. And all these ideas I, I've been trying to put up there, you know, or to give, or, or to give you ideas of, of what it would be like to work in schools, because all these teachers realize and thinkers that schools are where the children are right now, and we have to, to work within that uh, too, as well as show uh, what is possible outside of school. But I want to end you know this talk by noting that teaching and learning are not the sole province of schools of education. I want, these are the qualities that John Holt felt that people need to teach their own children. You know, and the first one, you have to like children, their company, foolishness, energy, and passion. That is so true. I know that many teachers do, and, and many get into the profession for that. But again, do we really have a context where children are welcomed like that in school? Um, you know, some schools do, I understand, and many homes uh, try, try to, uh, you know, also embrace that energy and passion rather than, you know, knock it down and contain it. But it also happens, you know, at homes, and, you know, those parents are probably not likely to homeschool, you know. I mean, it, I, I, it, it, so much of what goes on in school is, is like they want to take the, ch the child out of the child and just put the student in there. You know, um, you know, to think that children are energetic and uh, foolish and that they can be silly and that they can uh, go off task a lot. I mean, this is the nature of children. This isn't a disease to be cured. But, you know, I mean, you just have to read more Twain. Read, <laughs> look, look at how children learn before school, you know. <clears throat> so I, I think that, that we really... We really have to think hard about um, what's going on in school, and and that you know there there are there really are a lot of good things that take place outside of school, um, and this idea about thinking of children as close friends and trusting them as people. What Holt is saying there is that you want to trust your kids because he saw that even though many parents love their children, they don't trust them, but just like a close friend. You trust your close friend not to screw you, you know, to, to, to take the keys to your home and feed your cat while you're gone and not steal your money and so on. You have that, that trust, you know, um, and we have to develop that in our kids. And then also to feel in their hearts some of the wonder and curiosity and excitement about the world. So, you know, these are all qualities that I, I love, and I'm not going to, I mean, you could read them all. I mean, I, I'm not, I, I hate to be one of those PowerPoint uh, presenters who read you every slide. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not the point, though. But again, I, I do want to emphasize something here. Each one of these points that John Holt makes, he claims that this is what parents need. But then he writes, perhaps only a minority of parents have these qualities. Certainly some have more than others. Many will gain more as they know their children better. Most of the people who have been teaching their children at home say that it has made them like their children more, not less. And here, here it is. In any case, these are not qualities that can be taught or measured with a test or certified with a piece of paper. I love how, how Holt puts that. Each one of those points you cannot measure with a test or certify of a piece of paper. Certainly there's some computer programmer that says it can create a scale of 1 to 10 that will show you how much trust you have in, you know, <laughs> knowing what can be taught and what can't be taught is really important. We can't teach everything. Some things need to be felt and experienced. And this is the final thing I would just like to leave you. Don't let these ideas about how children should learn, when they should learn, and why they must learn, which is almost always to preserve the GDP, which is why we're pushing kids into STEM, 
sorts of subjects where they whether they're good at them or not. <laughs> you know, we we really we need to appreciate children as children more, and and if we work with them, we're going to find that that you know, as in schoolers have, and 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 some alternative school people that. Not only are there different scopes and sequences for helping children learn, but it creates a, a nicer life for us. You know, for for us meaning meaning people who want to be in the company of children. I want to see children in the flow of life, and and and, and don't want to segregate them away from uh, the world of adults and the world of work and the world of the world in general. I don't want to keep putting screens and teachers between children and experience. And this is what self-directed learning is, is about, finding teachers who are comfortable with that and who are able to work. I hope that these six concepts will, uh, will, will help you work more, uh, give you some sort of framework for working with kids um, in this way. And if you're not working in schools, I hope that the five ideas that John Holt presents here will give you the confidence to be skeptical about, you know, everything that is done in school. Not everything that works in school is going to work outside of school. So I have a couple of questions here. Oh, hi, Bill Ewer. I like this. Everything that can be counted doesn't necessarily count, and everything that counts can't necessarily be counted by Albert Einstein. That's great. So. Is there a magic core of knowledge that all must should know? This is from Maureen, um, you know, with self-directed learning. Um, you know, that to me is sort of a trick question because the knowledge that we all must know depends on what our, the path of our life is. If I'm going to be a scientist, I'm, I'm going to need to know different stuff than if I'm going to be a, a musician, you know? Um, so I don't think there is a magic core of knowledge, but that each of us develops that core, and that there are, of course, certain basic skills, which we've identified as reading, writing, and calculation, basic <coughs> socialization, how to you know, get along with people and stuff. But do we really need to put that in, into a curriculum? I mean, those things are part and parcel of the world. You know, and they, you know, they, they are part of, you know, when you're self-directed learning, if you wanted, if you know, if you, this is a great example. My my daughter Lauren wanted to uh, learn psychology, and when she was uh, in community college as a homeschooler at 16, they wouldn't let her because um, she wouldn't let her move on because the next course required her to take statistics. So we had emphasized math um, with, with her. Um, there was a lot of struggle, so finally we decided not not to push math. So at the age of 16, here she is faced with this thing. I want to be, I want to go into psychology, but I don't have statistics. So what did she do? She, with our support, you know, and help, she found uh, that the community college offered a course called Math 101, Fundamentals of Math, it was called. And in six months, she took that course and passed it, got her degree. I mean, was able, was able to enter the psychology class. And now, at the age of 27, she's getting her master's in social work and um, has been you know, deeply involved in, uh, in all sorts of aspects of psychology and social work. Um, so her self-directed knowledge eventually, you know, yeah, she was 16 until she needed to know statistics, and then she learned it in six months. I'm not sure that, that she would even have an interest in statistics if we'd been, been harping on that from you know, fifth grade on. Uh, this question comes up. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Maureen. You know, they're you know they're betting on the core knowledge is definable for all. Um, I remember when Edie Hirsch came out with that idea, and it, it still I don't know it's it still amazes me. You know, he feels that the core knowledge you know is going to make the world a, a, a better place, but yeah, I don't know. Everyone thinks that about their curriculum. Um, and then Sarah Kay asks, would you agree learners could be substituted for children? And Wild said, nothing worth learning can ever be taught. I love that quote. I didn't know that one. Um, but uh, I, I do agree that learners could be substituted for children. And, you know, I, I do want to say, though, that we, I think we also have to get away from this idea that learning is only for children. Um, you know, we, we learn differently as adults, and certainly as we gain experience, we get better at it. But we, we really need to... Uh, I think just think of ourselves as learners and children as um, as learners, and that we're all in this together. 
um, and that if we can feel that children's wonder and curiosity and excitement about the world, I think we'll be grateful for it. You know, so I, I, I think that learners could be substituted for children. Absolutely. And, uh, and it might be a better choice because then there's no age limit to it. So thank you for that. And I see it's 8 o'clock and I have to wind up now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, what a abrupt ending. I, uh, I love this list, and I actually put a note in the chat. I think that you could reframe this around the culture of the school um, for those who want to take something practical out of it. We do need to, to move on. We have other sessions. I've clapped for you, Pat. I can hover over the smiley face and I click on the applause button. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank Thanks, you. everybody, for an early start to our day. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. Off. So glad you kicked us off, Pat. Take care. Have a great day. You too, Steve. Good luck with everything. <laughs>